Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin. This is Life, Liberty, and Levin. We have a great guest, General Jack Keane. How are you, sir? Good to see you, Mark. I've watched you for a few years now, and you're exceptional, which is why I wanted to have you on this program. You know, we get caught up in a lot of the domestic politics, uh, the wall, the government shot. That's all very important. But so is foreign policy, so is national security, so is military policy. And I wanted to have you here to focus in on a few subjects. First of all, I want the public to know a little bit more about you. You're a graduate of the Army War College and the Command and General Staff College. You're a four-star general. There are not a lot of four-star generals. I sh I, you're the second one I've met in my entire life. Um, you completed over 37 years of public service in December 2003, culminating in your appointment as Acting Chief of Staff and Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army. You have a career as a uh, infantry pa uh, a paratrooper, a combat veteran of Vietnam, decorated for valor. You spent much of your military life in operational commands, where you had trips in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you advised senior defense officials with multiple visits during the surge period, and you provided assistance directly to General David Petraeus. And in December of 2018, you received the Ronald Reagan Peace Through Strength Award at the Reagan Library, the first military uh, official to ever receive that award. That's a big deal. Yeah, that was quite a humbling experience. You know, you, you get a number of awards when you're in a position like me, and, and you're certainly grateful for all of those, but that award really got to me, to be frank. I mean, I have tremendous regard for Ronald Reagan and what he stood for and, and what his legacy is, and, and I'm, I'm, I was honored. Are you impressed with the foreign policy of the current president, President Trump? Generally speaking, yes. Uh, I do have some difficulties with certain aspects of it, but I think what the, the administration truly got right is they set the strategic framework for how the world truly is. And that was expressed in the national security strategy that they published in their first December, first year in office, which even then was unprecedented. And they set a strategic framework that laid out in the world that we are really in an era of big power competition, namely with Russia and China, who want to destroy the international order that has existed for 70 plus years, principally designed to prevent major conflict like a World War III again. And I think those institutions have served us well. They want to depart from them because of their own national interests. And also the regional hegemony of Iran and their malign and aggressive behavior and what they have done in the Middle East and also globally in terms of state-sponsored terrorism. North Korea, a rogue state with nuclear weapons threatening the use of them, certainly when that strategy was crafted. Now at least we're talking to each other. And of course, radical Islam. Um, Middle East is the breeding ground for it, but the truth is it's on just about every continent and it's thriving and it's growing. So that strategy that they identified, I think they got about right. It was a major departure from, I think, the pretend strategy that we had under the Obama administration where we did not want to step up and identify these challenges in the world. I think I'm only speculating now largely because they didn't want to have to deal with them and be held accountable for a strategy to cope with these realities. Isn't non-involvement or non-engagement or a pretend strategy, isn't that provocative? I mean, our enemies see it, and they say, okay, Obama or whomever, they're saying this, but they don't really mean it. And then you have the invasion of Crimea. And then you have the beginning of these phony islands in the South China Sea. And then you have Russia moving into Syria and so forth and so on. I want to break each one of these down. Let's start with China. I'm just a pedestrian. But I see China as a major, major threat because of all the uh, focus and resources they're putting into their military and not just, you know, troops, their uh, strategic decisions, their space warfare activity that, the, that they're really leading on, stealing our technology, which they not only use for civilian purposes but military purposes, constantly claiming more and more uh, navigable waters that belong to the Philippines or belong to, uh, to Japan. And um, do you see China as the grave threat that I do? Yeah, absolutely. Indeed, so does the administration. The national defense strategy identified China as the number one strategic long-term threat to the American people and the security of the United States. I, I spent a year-long effort on a commission 
looking at the national defense strategy and also how it's being implemented. So I'm intimately familiar with what our challenges are here. Uh, first of all, many people in the United States, after Dow Xiaoping started to conduct economic reform and open up China's marketplace and move towards capitalism, fell in on China. Our business leaders fell in on them, strategists, analysts. Like 25 years ago or so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two plus decades, absolutely yeah. right. And the thought was is, is that if we help China along in terms of developing them economically, that political reform will follow. Well, we lost that bet because that hasn't happened. China has doubled down on, on authoritarianism. They are fundamentally run by a very closed Chinese Communist Party. When you think of China, you just shouldn't think of uh, all the wonderful things that's inside the culture of that country. You've got to think about who runs it. Chinese Communists run it. And they run it with absolute iron hand and, and control of the people. What they're about is now in writing and in public discourse, it used to be in the closet, so to speak, until President Xi came along. And he has set some serious formidable goals for them. One, to dominate and control the Pacific, the Asia-Pacific region at the expense of the United States, and to try to drive us out of there and cut off the relationship that we have with our allies. Two, is to replace the United States in the late 2030s, early 2040s, replace the United States as the world's global leader. And they are about doing this, and they have a couple of pillars to accomplish it. One is their, their economic predators, and they use that engine of investment in emerging countries to pull them to them with some pretty tough behavior, which they put money into these countries, the countries default on loans, they take over the infrastructure projects that they were promising. They don't deliver a quality product, as a matter of fact. They only use Chinese labor when they're doing it, and they insist on Huawei, their s service system, to be the main driver in that country, and their telecom units as well, which means they're taking over the personal intelligence of the people in that country for generations to come. They are opening up sea, seaports because they want to be a global power like the United States, so they have a Navy base in Djibouti. They have another one that they're developing in Pakistan, and they are taking over many of the ports that are in the, the key choke points around the world in terms of operating those ports. Who runs the Panama Canal? China. China runs the Panama Canal. They, they, they help operate it. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't they have a foothold it. there, effectively. They have a foothold there, and for why? For obvious reasons. It's of strategic influence in the world today, and it helps to control commerce. They're South China Sea. They've militarized the Chi South China Sea, which they told President Obama they really weren't doing, but everybody knew they were doing it, to include our intelligence services that were working for President Obama. They militarized the South China Sea, because half of the world's economy passes through the South China Sea. And in a time of conflict or unrest, they want to have control. 62% of their oil comes out of the Middle East. They know that the United States carrier battle group could tie that up in terms of confrontation, and it's the Achilles heel right now of China. That is why the port exists in Djibouti. That is why they're building another one in Pakistan near the Indian Ocean. They want to have economic influence initially that will give them geopolitical influence and ultimately control. What you're suggesting here is they are preparing for, not necessarily ready to launch, preparing for an offensive war against the United States. Why else would they be doing all this? Okay, th that's a great question. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with that a little bit. Yeah. Okay? They saw... Desert Storm, 1991, the prowess of the United States. Before that, we had been involved in Vietnam protracted war and, uh, on low technology. We recovered from that largely due to the Reagan administration, which got us on a, a proper footing with the Soviet Union and upscaled all of our military capabilities. The American people didn't really know how good we got until they saw that. Well, guess what? 
So did Russia, and so did China see that, and it spooked both of them. As a result of that, and then the, the Iraq invasion in 2003 was another data point for them. They made this conclusion. One, we don't want to fight a war with the United States, a conventional war, a high-end war, because of the cap capabilities they have. Two, what we need to do is get those capabilities ourselves to a certain degree, and in certain cases, have special capabilities that the United States doesn't have. So in the event we have to fight that war, that we're not going to be disadvantaged. But here's the key thing that they've done. China wants to avoid conflict with the United States, so they have developed what I'm calling gray zone operations to conduct operations below the level of conflict that will get them the same results that conflict would get, which is what? Geopolitical control and influence. So South China Sea, East China Sea, areas around Japan and Taiwan are all about intimidation, coercion, undermining civil society, undermining governments, taking over media operations that have a spin that they want as far south as Australia. This is a major campaign. They have 130,000 commercial fishing boats that work for the PLA. It's the People's Liberation Army, all militarized with proper GPS and also radio communications to do what? To intimidate and coerce other fishing rights that countries have in the regions. Day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, they're wearing down these countries in terms of their own sovereignty. They, they violate their air, mar air and maritime rights on a regular basis. And they're trying to demonstrate to those allies. Now, General Keene, as I mentioned before we left, they're also militarizing space. The Russians are too. We'll get to them in a moment. They're militarizing space to do what? Well, first of all, they recognize how dependent we are on space te technology. So they have... Many, many years ago, they began to develop anti-satellite kill capability. And now it's a major endeavor of theirs. And here's the reason. Uh, obviously, GPS and all the location would be taken out by that, all of our communications, but all of our weapons telemetry. So when you, when you see uh, cruise missiles flying and, and precision-guided munitions coming out of airplanes, all of that is controlled by satellite technology. Mm. And they would actually bring us to our knees if they took those satellites down. The president is right about making sure we have an emphasis on space. Because eventually, space will be weaponized. We will have capabilities flying around in space on, on space stations that will be weaponized to kill other things that are passing through space, like missiles, airplanes, or whatever is passing through there, they're going to take it out. So we've got to stay involved, technology and space. The Chinese, in, in some respects, have caught up to us in terms of satellite technology, but they're, they're ahead of us in terms of anti-satellite technology. Because I read that the Obama administration cut off resources for it. And while, so the Chinese are moving as fast as they can, and the president's trying to play catch-up uh, to what the Chinese have done. What are we doing about all this? What are we doing about China? Yeah. Well, first of all, the president, I think, is absolutely right in taking China on economically. It's obviously not my expertise, but nonetheless, clearly, intellectual property theft, forcing joint ventures on our business companies, and the tariff imbalances are pretty significant. Endeavors of the Chinese, they've gotten away with it from years. This is something that the president's been talking about for 20-something years. So he's absolutely right about doing that, and I give them plenty of credit. I think we still don't have a comprehensive strategy to deal with China's gray zone operations, which intimidates and coerces our allies. While the military can play a role there, and we're doing some of that by navigating through the South China Sea and East China Sea when we feel like it, even though China says that's our waterway, it's not. It's international waterway, but they claim it. That, that's important. But we need a, a whole of government strategy. We need a political, economic, military aspect. We need an information campaign. The Chinese, what they do domestically, it, they're a repressive society. And what they're doing around the world in terms of their cyber offensive capability, we've got to expose that and, 
They're paranoid and insecure about what the Chinese Communist Party actually does. And they kind of keep a lot of that in the closet. We got we to gotta pull back the veil of mystery that surrounds all of that, get all of, our, all of our allies involved in that as well, and push these guys back into a box. And a lot of that will take non-military comprehensive strategy to do. I think we need to do some work there. The second thing is... Who is we? Where do we... The president makes a decision. He says, okay, do what General Cain said. Who does that? That's part of the problem, isn't it? Which department? Which office? Well, that's Where a great question, and, you know, so that our viewers can understand that. When the president makes a decision, look, it, I want to do something about China. He doesn't have to get into the details about it. I want to push back on these guys. I think our strategy is right. They are threatening to us. They're our number one threat. Put together a strategy to do that. That is the province of the National Security Advisor. The director of the, the National Security Council is one and the same person. <clears throat> they bring the whole of government effort together in terms of what is the overall strategy and what are the elements of the, imp of the implementation of that strategy. Bring that to the president. Put some options in front of him. Associate the risk with each option. Let him make some decisions about doing all. So John that. Bolton would would be the John Bolton be the now. H. R. McMaster uh, before that. Okay. Now India. India obviously is a very big country with a lot of people. Their military is certainly not up to the standards as the Chinese. But apparently they're starting to pour a lot of resources into their military, because like. With all the countries in the region, China's pushing, 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 and they're pushing India too. Do you know what India is trying to do to respond to this? Well, they're, <clears throat> militarily, they they're certainly increasing their capability. They are very concerned about China's predatory nature in their region. China is in the Indian Ocean every single day. By the way, just as a data point, China now has more combat ships than the United States Navy. And they're going to go right past us in all of this. Now, people say, well, they only have two aircraft carriers. Well, they're never going to have as many aircraft carriers as we do because they're not certain you can protect those. Given the missiles that China has, they know that they can take down our aircraft carriers and our surface ships. Not easily, but they know if they swarm missiles at them, they likely can do that. So they know how vulnerable they are. But the point is, India is intimidated by China's behavior. They have been aligned with Russia for military capability, as you know, for years. But we have made inroads into India, and I think we're getting closer to them than we've ever been in a generation. Why? Because we both see the domination of China and what they're seeking in that region at the expense of the countries in that region. And they have a Western-friendly prime minister over there now, too. And Very much so. Yeah. We'll be right back. General Keene, Russia. You know, it's a relatively poor country. It's got the GDP of Texas. It doesn't have an enormous number of people, relatively, again speaking. And yet, under Putin, they're really focused on uh, R&D on their military, too, aren't they? Oh, yeah, very much so. You're, you're right to start with some of the challenges that Russia has, because th they are significant. Um, they're the largest country landmass in the world. They have 150 million people in it, which is half the population, less than half the population of, of the United States. Of the industrialized states, they have the, they're number one in HIV. They're number one in respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, they have an enormously high alcoholic problem in their country, and they've had that for generations. And their economy is in a tank, the ruble is in trouble, inflation is spiraling out of control, and they're a one commodity product country in terms of oil and gas, and very dependent on what the prices in the market are for all of that. All that said, Russia, I think because of Putin and the leaders around him, having suffered through the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were much younger when that took place, and they certainly are frustrated by their leaders, who they, who they hold accountable for that loss, are energized, intensely so, about returning Russia to a world stage and to a sense of greatness for the nation. And if any of you have ever spent time in Russia, being around the Russian people is a good thing. They're good people. They're hardy people. They're tough people. 
22 million of them were killed in World War II standing up to Nazism and that aggression. They got within 30 miles of Moscow and they made that army turn around defeated. Quite remarkable what they did. They have pride and Putin knows that. He, he knows that population will suffer uh, and be willing to suffer. So that's what, what he does as a strategy. He creates this myth that the United States is really the aggressor in the world, that we've caused all the problems in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, that we are the strategic problem. And what has to be done is we must contain the United States. And NATO is also a threat to us, much as Germany was a threat to us in the past, they will, could possibly be a threat to us in the future. And it's true. While we don't believe that Europe is going to attack Russia again, as Germany did in World War II, the Russians have it in their psychic. A Frenchman was there in the 19th century and put Moscow on fire. A German was there in the 20th century and came mighty close to doing very much the same thing. They want a buffer on their, east, on their western border that they had post-World War II all the way up until 1991. That's Eastern Europe. All of that is largely in NATO now. Putin is fixated on NATO. He wants to weaken it. The transatlantic alliance that has served us so well for all of these years, now there's challenges with it, to be sure. A lot of those governments are social democracies and some of those leaders are feckless. They won't stand up even to protect their own people, much less the alliance. And they, they, some of them lack spine as, in terms of what their predecessors were like. Henry Kissinger said once they move down the line of social democracies, the, the Europeans will find it difficult not only to fight for somebody else, but even to fight for themselves. And I think that, that prophetic statement that he made 30 years ago has turned out to be somewhat true. All that said, the NATO alliance is very important to us. Russia wants to weaken it, they eventually want to break it, and they want to weaken the United States' will to be a global leader in the world today. And yet, uh, there they are in Syria, I think they're even in the North Pole, they're, they're trying to move out, uh, they are developing weapons systems, hypersonic weapons, as the Chinese are too. Um, is Putin just an irritant, or is he a serious problem? Isn't he, isn't he also uh, building alliances with the Chinese? Yeah, I think he, he, Russia today is, is a threat. There are adversaries, to be sure. Um, and because of Putin's aggressiveness and his lack of patience, by comparison to the Chinese, I think he's much more of a near-term threat for us. The economic burdens and social burdens that we just discussed are a millstone and it'll, it'll become much more of a mother load for them as time goes on and it'll actually weaken the nation state and its capacity to wage a major war. But I'm telling you, Mark, um, on the commission I was on for the national defense strategy for a year, um, well, I can't get into all the details of it. Uh, we certainly provided it to the Congress. The, in a general sense, if we had to deal with Russia, in Europe today, we're an ocean away. We have very little capacity there for the United States. It's not what we had post-World War II for all of those years of the Cold War. We would be challenged if we were fighting, say, over the Baltics. Article 5, NATO declares it. One country attacked. All 28 countries respond to that. We're collectively going to fight Russia. That I, I want to ask you when we come back, why is it a challenge? Is it because we've removed so many resources? Is it because we haven't upgraded? Is it because there aren't enough troops? I'll ask you in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, every week, most weeknights, you can watch me on Levin TV, Levin TV. Here's how you sign up. Call 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV, or check us out at blazetv.com slash mark, blazetv.com slash mark. We'll be right back. In over Eastern Europe, we have to get there. We're an ocean away. We would struggle with that. Our commission concluded our casualty rates for personnel and high-value assets, ships and airplanes in particular, some of our most sophisticated, 
would be at rates we haven't seen since the Korean War and World War II. That, and that, I think, is an absolute fact. Because of the same technology the Chinese are working with? Yeah. China and Russia have, are using the same asymmetric capability. When they, saw, when they saw Desert Storm and the Iraq War, as I mentioned before, high-end conventional warfare by the United States, they realized the only way you could win a war against the United States, you would have to take away the air power premise and prowess that we have. And that's just not airplanes, it's cruise missiles, it's the whole ensemble of it. They blind us. Yeah, and once you take that away, whatever they're doing on the ground, say in Europe, <clears throat> becomes very vulnerable to their, their, their tanks, airplanes, and missiles. So if we were fighting over the Baltics, they have at Kaliningrad offensive ship missiles, long-range missiles, and they can bring up to the border of Russia strike bombers using cruise missiles that can range every airfield we have in Europe and every port that our ships are coming Well, now, into. let me ask you this, and I don't want you to give away any national security secrets. Can we do the same to them? We can do a lot of damage to them, but we have to get there. See, in the Cold War, we were pre-positioned there. We had stocks and warehouses, and we had 400,000 troops. No one is suggesting we need something like that today. But we have to increase our deterrence. To prevent conventional war that I'm talking about, the, the way we have done that in the past so successfully is making certain that we have adequate deterrence. What is deterrence? Deterrence is getting in the, side of, in, the, in the head of your adversary. He looks at that capability you have, and it's real. And it's, and it's going to impose significant cost on him. Right now, that capability is not what it should be when you're looking at China and when you're looking at Russia. That's why the Trump defense buildup is so important to us. It can't be two years. It's got to be five or six to dig ourselves out of this hole that we put ourselves in. The second thing is not only does he have to see the capability is going to impose cost, but he's got to believe that you would use it. In the Obama presidency, I would suggest the capability wasn't what it should be, and we're improving on that, but we're not there yet. But he knew, Putin knew full well that Obama wouldn't use it. That's not where we are today. When they look at the Trump administration and President Trump, they know that he would use it. And they, I think, despite all the rhetoric that's going on about Russia, the thing that Putin pays more attention to than anything else is that defense buildup that's going on. Why? Because when Reagan did the defense buildup in the 1980s, that contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. It wasn't singular, certainly. There were other factors involved, and a lot of them were internal problems that the Soviet Union had. But it was a major contributor to it. Putin is looking at that, and he fears the United States getting the advanced capability that it has always had and getting back to having the conventional domination that we had. Has Trump been tougher on Russia than Obama? Oh, by far. Absolutely by far. What happens is you're the president, and it, it mystifies me a little bit, I mean, just to be frank about it, and, uh, is that he, he goes way out of his way to want to be friendly with adversaries. So it's, it's President Xi, who's his very good friend. And it's, it's Putin, who he wants to have a relationship with. He knows it's not quite right. And even with Kim Jong-un, who's one of the true thugs of the world. Um, but I, 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 I give him some concession here, because I think the motivation is simply this. He knows full well that these are adversary nations. They're much more than competitors to the United States. He'll maybe use that word to be nice. But he knows full well these are adversaries. And these, these are countries that can clearly threaten the security of the United States. But I think what he believes is, based on his own personal attributes, he thinks if I can have a decent relationship with an adversary, maybe we can make some progress. But he's been tougher on every one of those countries you mentioned than Obama ever was. And that's the bottom line. He's tough where he needs to be tough most of the time. And I think these other, as you were saying, these other leaders, they either respect him or they fear him or they're not sure what to expect of him, but they're not taking provocative actions right now because of him. We'll be right back. I travel to the Middle East, Europe, and the Far East. And when I'm talking to uh, leaders around the world, at, at times they're uncertain because 
the president speaks so frequently on so many subjects. Um, and, but I think they're adjusting to that. They're, they're not used to having a president of the United States you know, speak publicly virtually every single day. What I tell them is pay attention to U.S. policy. Because U.S. policy, as it pertains to your region and to your country, there's only one person making a decision on that policy, and that's President Trump. So pay attention to policy. And certainly you're going to pay attention to what the president's saying, but it's the policy that's the most important thing. Iran. How do you think the president's handled Iran? He, has, he went to Riyadh last summer, 55 leaders in the room, and he told them this. He said, I stand here with you, and I want to cooperate with you to standing up to the number one strategic threat in this region, what is Iran. And I know the administration has been trying to stitch together a closer alliance with the Middle East nations, sort of like what I call an Arab NATO, which I think is, is very much needed. The Iranians, ever since the Islamic Republic of Iran was formed in 1980, have had a singular goal, which is dominate and control the Middle East. To accomplish that goal, they have two objectives. One, drive the United States out of the region, and two, destroy the state of Israel. And they make this statement I'm talking about in almost the same words I'm describing every single year for the last 37 years. That's the reality of, of what we're dealing with here. And they, are, and they are succeeding at that. What's the measure of that success? Control of Lebanon, almost total control of Syria, except for the portion where we are in eastern Syria, more political influence in Iraq than what we have, beginning the civil war in Yemen for the single purpose of encroaching on Saudi Arabia, because Yemen is to the south of that, and that is the prize that they have been after, so they can squeeze Saudi Arabia from Syria and also from the south. Cut off the water lanes. And cut off the water, absolutely, the Straits of Hormuz. And, of course, Syria is most largely about its their strategic anchor in the Middle East. It's most largely about encroaching on Israel. There's 130,000 rockets that they have placed in Lebanon for that purpose as we speak today. And they're also putting, they want to put bases in Syria with missiles and rockets there. Every time they try to do that, Israel attacks them. What can Israel do about this? Russia has sort of sent mixed signals, stop hitting sites in Syria. This is really life or death for the Israelis, isn't it? Oh, yeah, very much so. That is why they, they've literally conducted somewhere between 100 and 150 airstrikes into Syria going against Iranian targets. Iran is very aggressive here. They fly rockets and missiles into Damascus airport, put them in warehouses. Israelis just struck it two weeks ago in one of those warehouses at the international airport of Damascus. They, they have a land bridge from Iran through Iraq through Syria. It isn't formalized yet. That's one of the things that I'm opposed to is why we would pull out prematurely from Syria. We don't want that land bridge forming. The threat to Israel is real. I think publicly they do not disagree with the president's decision because they have not had a president as supportive of Israel in a generation as President Trump is. Privately, they were really taken back by the decision because they know it impacts on their security. You think war there is inevitable? I want your answer when we come back. We'll be right back. So, General, war between Israel, Iran, or some collection of countries in the Middle East, is it in inevitable? Yeah, it's more likely. And I think the success they've had in Syria, particularly if they're able to gain control of the entire country, will contribute significantly to it. And they try to avoid direct confrontation themselves. They use their proxies, and they've been so successful at that. It started right after they took over the country, the Iranian country, uh, from the Shah. When they blew up the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon, they used their proxies, Marine Barracks proxies, Air Force Barracks in Saudi Arabia, four years in Iraq targeted on killing American soldiers, a 10-year hostage-taking program that they sponsored. They killed our CIA station chief, and it damaged the Reagan presidency where it nearly brought the presidency down. 
what they would do here is use their proxies again from Lebanon, from Syria, m multiple locations firing simultaneously into Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, imposing casualties on the Israelis that they have never seen in their history rather significantly. That would lead to major confrontation. I believe an Israeli response to something like that, and I think this is what the Iranians are not anticipating, they would go full throttle into Lebanon. And if that wasn't enough, they would go to Iran and take as much of their military capabilities out. That is war. And the Iranians are serious when they say every single year, drive the United States out of the region is our objective to accomplish our ultimate goal and destroy the state of Israel. And they are about that business. And I think the leaders of Israel know it. This president is very much aware of it and tuned into that. And we have got to make certain. Who wins that war? Israel does, aided by the United States. They have never, ever asked us to fight with them. They have asked us to help them in terms of military capability. And a lot of these Arab countries probably won't sit on the sidelines either. They may view it as an opportunity as well. Do you, the relationship with Israel and the Arab states, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and Jordan has never been closer. And I mean, we're at the point where they share intelligence together. Think of that. These are countries that were warring at one time, and now they're literally helping each other against a common enemy. Yeah, because just, again, as a pedestrian, I don't see Israel sitting there and only fighting in Lebanon. If they're taking it in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, they're going to say, okay, we're going to hit Tehran, we're going to hit yeah. their government center, we're going to hit their military centers, and we're going to hit them with everything we've got. That's true. And that's why. I, I hope the administration can stitch together an Arab NATO because standing together collectively against the Iran would really impose a deterrent capability where the cost would be the destruction of their regime if they tried to do something. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hope it doesn't reach that point. And let's hope it doesn't reach the point where Iran gets nuclear weapons either. It's been a great honor, General. Yeah, it's I enjoyed pleasure. it. Thanks Good so talking to you, Mark. Appreciate it. Don't miss us next time on Life, Liberty, and Levin.